This week on Their Lives, we interviewed an ex-Trotskyite militant from Senegal turned social pacifist. Mustafa Jouf is the Associate Professor at the University of Vermont and talks about his dramatic transformation. He speaks about the beauty of compromise, how to strike an agreement, carefree life as a student and transforming your political views, his friendship with Bernie Sanders, how to start a peaceful revolution and mobilise change in your society. We began by asking Mustafa how it all began. I was born in Kaulak, probably the third largest city. And my father, a uh, teacher, and my mom, a uh, midwife, nurse. So uh, I could say that I grew up in a fairly uh, privileged family background. And then after, after school, like many uh, of my generation, so I, I went to, to France. But basically, we just had like a, the, a normal semi-privileged upbringing from my parents uh, in Senegal. Mm. So uh, you know, I went to the best school, high school, some of them private schools. Uh, uh, I could say that I was fortunate to have my parents who were well off uh, and uh, who really gave me this kind of opportunity to be where I am today. Uh, after my earlier childhood, uh, so like some of my generation, we, I went to Europe. Paris, uh, French being the colonizers. So if you are relatively privileged, usually you go to study in Europe. So some of the underprivileged people will study at the university here. I never went to the university locally speaking here. All my training were abroad, uh, early training in France. And then uh, after I finished my master entering a doctoral program in the University of Paris, uh, I came back to Senegal for vacation, and I told myself, let me try the job market. And I found this opportunity with the possibility to go to the United States for another training. So this is how I left Paris. Well, what, well what, let's, let's set the context then. What year was that in then? You, when, you, when you went off from, decided to go off from France back to Senegal and off to America? 1976. 76. The world, the, the world was a different place in 76, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a different place. We didn't have Corona very first. Yeah. <laughs> and we That's have true. this very utopian philosophy. As younger students, I was the Trotskyist. If you're familiar with the Trotskyist movement, it's part of the communist movement from Leon Trotsky. Wow. And uh, with the Force International, I used to belong to be a militant of the Force International. So uh, it was quite interesting. You know, we have this like utopian lifestyle. We had this big dream that would be changing the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, with no problem because, you know, when you are a student, you don't have really that much to worry about. You're living in the moment. You are careless, good, as a student. And you can follow some dreams to change the world. It feels quite contrary, though, to me, having this kind of revolutionary Trotsky ideology and then going off to America in the 70s, which exactly. don't, it doesn't, exactly. doesn't epitomize the same values. So what, what drew you towards the States? Exactly. This is an excellent question. And I've been asked that question even from my colleague in the U.S. I went to the United States uh, because I have a, an opportunity, a PhD. And then, uh, you know, my, the challenge was for me, to move from the francophone uh, educational background and to embark in an anglophone. Senegal was not colonized by, by an anglophone country. And the opportunity, and I have to admit that the United States has been always like a, a myth to our generation. You know, a myth to, this is the world that untouched by the French colonies. That was one of the also motivating interests. Now, that's a paradox because coming from a Trotskyite, why would you go to the imperialist country like the United States? Right, exactly. So uh, one thing is that uh, in the United States, and this is the paradox, you have very conservative ideology movement. At the same time, you have very progressive idea, although it's not well developed. There are states or cities in the New England era, in California. So you have very progressive movement. To some extent, far more progressive than the European 
Okay, if you look at the feminist movement, we can talk about the, the driving force behind the feminist movement, the ideology and all, and where it stands today because of many Americans really who fought for the right, birth control, abortion, despite the fact that you have very conservative movement in the United States. That's a paradox. It is, yeah. The biggest gain or progress made in the civil rights movement or for, for human rights in general has been the movement led by the Martin Luther King, uh, some very, very charismatic, emblematic leaders. Well, you, you, you arrived in the States very much on the back of that. Did you see a dramatically transformed country? Yeah, because when I, when I came to the States, it was in 1982. Mm-hmm. Uh, the progressive movement was not that strongly entrenched, you could say that. But gradually, with globalization and its negative impact and a generational shift, they demystify racism, they demystify sexism. And this is why someone like Barack Obama could be elected because it's not the black electorate. Left alone, he could not be elected. It's people like you, my daughter's generation, my students, who were mobilized to change their society. And it was unbelievable. Now, they transcended the racial barrier. The white, white population, white students. To a point where it's a debate that well, we enter a post-racial society. I'm not getting there. No, no, sure. But yeah. do, you still, but, do you still think that, that that transformation and drive is there amongst young people still today? Oh, yeah. Look at the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. The guy is 38 years old, okay? Mm-hmm. The big fraction of his electoral base are students 18 up 30, 35. Because Bernie Sanders is a good friend of mine, came to my, to my classes at the University of Vermont three times to lecture on social inequality. The beauty of having a small state like Vermont, you have the, the senator, is very reachable. He will come to my class and lecture. When, when he came, all the students will be gathering and he's lecturing. It's beautiful because he loved that. So shifting, shifting priorities and influencing change is really, sometimes can be really, really hard. Mm-hmm. And, and Bernie has been probably a great example of someone who's tried to influence change, been pushing and pushing and pushing on these issues. And now suddenly people are starting to wake up and actually hear that message. Throughout your life, what have you done to in, try and influence change? Or what sort of characteristics do you think mm-hmm. someone needs to influence change? Uh, you have to believe in yourself, yes? And you have to believe that even if you are alone in your, your p- political platform, you have to believe in yourself. People can trust you. Uh, also, you have to be able to navigate through the kind of political landscape in a way that uh, you, you'll bring together a coalition, okay? A winning coalition in many ways. But also you have to uh, make people dream about that change is possible because we have been told that there's nothing we can do. You regard to poverty, for instance, uh, healthcare, all those programs are seen by the conservative as subsidies for the, the poor. So, uh, but if you can t- tell them we can shift to priority to come to the rescue of those who really who are really hurting, and then year after year after year, like Bernie Sanders has been this, the same discourse, where the Bush administration and the entering Ad- Obama administration, they put together a package of more than $700 billion to come to the risk of Lehman Brothers, all the big insurance, those companies called too big to fail. This is welfare program. It's the federal government subsidizing those companies. Why can't they do it for the people who are in the poverty line and so on? Lots of different political figures, or in order to bring about change, had maintained a defiant position in terms of ideology. But of course, much of your work and much of what you talked about was also about compromise and resolution with others. So how do you reconcile two kind of contrasting things there? You know, one, sticking by what you believe in, and two, trying to bridge the divide in societies. Excellent question. Uh, You always should know how far you can go in compromising. If you are losing your core set of value and, and political orientation, then you have lost your, your ideal. Do you have an example of when you think that's happened? Yeah, for instance, uh, our earlier inclination, our, I'm saying we, the militant in the, from the left, and we had this kind of superiority complex vis-a-vis other people seen as conservative. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what we didn't know at that time was that we were marginalizing ourselves. We were losing uh, 
significant segment of the the population that we wanted to could convert to our ideals. So we're left with a, a sect, sectarian move, let's face it. What lessons can be born out of that, do you think, for, for people my age who might who might be sitting at home thinking, I want to bring about radical change? What can they take from what you've gone through about how maybe to do that effectively? The, the, the only way you can bring about change nowadays is to compromise. This is the old debate between reform and revolution. You know, if you are a revolutionary, then uh, you, you tend to, to believe that almost there's no compromise with petty bourgeois conservative movement. In doing so, we were in effect in gaining traction or uh, bringing new people to our movement. So uh, at least to, 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 to help build the coalition, because not everybody can be on your position, your initial position. So when we understood that, we shifted from our initial position to come to the center. I was, and I'm still very much influenced by the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. People like Anthony Giddens, uh, who was uh, part of the, the architect of the Blairism, Tony Blair, before he broke up with, with, with Blair. Those uh, social thinkers uh, were reform-oriented. Most of them realized that the revolution is not going to happen in their lifetime. According to the way we saw it classically, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1970, that's gone. Before that, the Basi 1871 French Revolution, that's gone. Those are now idealistic movements. We enter a world which is completely transformed. And for us to adapt to the world, we have to integrate or embrace the new trend shaping the landscape. We enter the age of the Afghan worker to a point where the working class has ceased to become or see itself as a revolutionary class. All they want is to improve their living condition and aspire to a better lifestyle. They are not waiting for the revolution to give them that. The, the alternative to the revolution is social reform. The, the art of the compromise resides on uh, listening capacity that from both sides. You went from being someone who had uh, different views at the early stages of your life and mm -hmm. have changed your views considerably. What yeah. is something you believe in that others think you're insane? What is, the, is there something that you believe in that others think you are completely wrong? Yeah, I, well, I, 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 I believe in the socialization of the means of production, which means to spread the wealth. Uh, but the nature of human nature is such that we are, we are greedy. We are, we are self-centered. Uh, and how do you achieve that kind of idealistic notion that we have to socialize the need to each according to his or her needs and in society? So that today people will tell you it's a utopian, okay? And then just an example here. With the coronavirus uh, crisis, this is globalization being demystified. We have been told by globalization advocate that this is the trend, yes. It's like a borderless society. The nation state is withering away. You have multilateralism, uh, international organization from the UN agency, and everybody, everything is globalized. But the crisis here has revealed the paradox of globalization, for instance. Yeah? So what is revealed is that the notion of global solidarity is not there. You have interdependent unit and country but nobody cares about the global system. All politics are local, and they start at the nation state. And this crisis has shown, even in the Europe, among the European countries, that everybody trying to uh, take care of your own entity uh, or nation state. Going back to your question, mm -hmm. things I believe and people think I'm crazy. Uh, this is the kind of things. I believe that it's like going back to John Lennon. Imagine the world, that kind of, this very level of, political naivete uh, that uh, we, we fall in. But at the same time, uh, you realize that at one point you have to move to the next. You have to change your idea uh, to do that, yes. There was another yeah. quick fire question. And this one seems to follow on, which is, you must have changed your mind about something over the, over the years. And mm -hmm. what's been the biggest transformation in your own personal mindset and opinion as, as the decades have gone by? Is that, is that the market is not going to collapse. And when I started working as a university uh, professor, and my pension 
are invested in the stock market. My anti-capitalist, but yet I don't want the stock market to collapse because I have my benefit and retirement plan pension tied to the stock market. How do I reconcile this? My ideology, my heart from the left, and then my interest for my retirement invested in the stock market. The very system that I fought all my life, and at least on theoretical and ideological terms as a trust case. Here I am. I don't want the stock market to collapse because I'm watching what happened to my pension, my retirement. This is one of the major paradox to a point where I argue that we have to reform society, but we cannot kill the golden goods that generate profit for us. The, I'm, I'm wary yeah. that the internet connection is not very strong. So I just wanted to add a very, very final question, if you can still hear us, which is a lot of what you've talked about has been what you've learned through hindsight, a change of ideology. And I'm wondering what your one piece of advice would be if you met, say, your 20, 25 year old self now. Uh, the first thing I'll tell you, leave, your, leave, leave for your dream. It's okay to be called a utopian, and, but it's okay to dream. Leave mm-hmm. for your dream, especially when you are younger. But as you move next stage in your life and you get older, then, quote, uh, you become more realistic yeah. about yeah. This is the era of real politics between like ideological utopian model and then the real politics. A real politics meaning to take consideration the reality in which you are operating and living, which is not always controlled by you, but the reality may be fashioning, modeling your own lifestyle. You have to be conscious about that. Yeah? It's good to have dreams, but at the same time, you have to be pragmatic. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Their Lives with Mustafa Juf. It was a really insightful interview, for sure. A very interesting individual indeed, going from being a militant Trotskyite, someone who had a utopianistic style of thinking, but maturing his political views over time and eventually becoming that president of the Millennium Challenge account and playing such an important role in Senegalese-American relations. There were three lessons that I personally took from our interview with Mustafa. Number one, if you want to make a change, compromise is the most important thing in your toolkit. Making sure you compromise with the other individual and not shutting them out, listening to their views, listening to their opinions and trying to understand where you can come to an agreement without sacrificing your true principles and values. Second important point which we could go on, uh, which we can talk about for a very long time it could almost be an episode in itself, is this compromise between realism and idealism. The best way to win, mix idealism with realism and add hard work. This will often bring much more than you could ever hope for. That's a quote by John Wooden, the famous basketball player and head coach at the University of California. So I think that the lessons that Mustafa is talking about is appropriate for the workplace, it's appropriate for our social life, our relationships, and of course, political change too. The third and final lesson is if you want to make a change in your society, if you want to make a social impact, the way Mustafa says it should be done, like his good friend Bernie Sanders, is by maintaining the same discourse throughout. This, of course, does not mean you shouldn't compromise, but it means that you should have values that you stand by and honour. So this wraps up episode four of Their Lives. This episode serves as a kind of two-parter where we will be speaking to the old ambassador to the United States from Senegal, Amadou Lamine Ba. And that will be coming up in the next few weeks or so. So If you enjoyed this episode, please do leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And you can reach out to both of us on Twitter at Benji underscore Fisher and at Benji Hire. Our Instagram page is at It's Their Lives. But in the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and we will see you very soon.